What, what are your thoughts on this, well, this breakdown of relations between Tel Aviv and, U, and the UN? Well, I think Israel has always felt that the UN has been biased against it for a number of reasons. One, that the UN does spend a lot of time discussing the Israel-Palestine issue and has done so over the last 30, 40 years. And secondly, the vast majority of member states at the UN, and it is an intergovernmental body, it's not a supranational body, um, obviously take the side of Palestine against Israel in those debates. So Israel always feels that it's in a, a small minority um, when it's being discussed at the UN. Yeah. Now, I think Israel at the moment is rather unwise to be picking up a fight with uh, Antonio Guterres, because what Guterres said, as he clarified today, was fairly unexceptional, and indeed a statement of the obvious, in a sense, when he said that um, these events didn't happen in a vacuum having already clearly condemned them as acts of terror and said that no Palestinian grievance could justify uh, such uh, horrendous uh, acts. And I think it's unwise of Israel, I mean, for a number of reasons. One is it further alienates them from potential allies. You've seen a tougher line being taken by Saudi Arabia. You've seen the comments by President Erdogan of Turkey today, who, again, was also had relatively good relations with Israel until recently, but is now openly saying that Hamas is a, is a, is a resistance movement, not a terrorist organization. And secondly, uh, Israel is going to need the UN. It needs the UN in the short term to help with the humanitarian uh, issues that there are in Gaza, but will also need the UN in the longer term after they have finished their military campaign and, they hope, eliminated Hamas as a military force and as a political organization yeah. because someone is going to have to administer Gaza if it isn't Hamas and that can only be done probably with the authority of the United Nations and possibly a more direct involvement of the United Nations. So to, to, to use a, I don't know, a crude, really crude phrase, you think Israel in this case have been rather oversensitive and made things more difficult for, for themselves in the future. Well, Israel is always very sensitive about um, criticism that it receives, and they're in a state, obviously, of uh, anger at what has happened, at the terrorist attacks on their civilians, um, and high state of emotion. And I think in those circumstances, from their point of view, you're either with us or against us. Yes. And, you know, they see the Americans, the British government, and others who've been sort of fully supportive in, in, in public, um, and others who say something that perhaps more object objectively you could say was more balanced, they immediately take against. So mm. I think uh, they are sensitive um, and they're in a particularly sensitive moment. Right. Now, uh, Israel has now said they're going to uh, delay a ground offensive at America's request because America wants to get more air defense into place to protect American assets in the in the region. Israel have not, as we speak, have not said they're going to have the the pause in the aerial bombardment that now so many, including America, including Britain, including European leaders are calling for. As someone who wasn't just a, an ambassador in New York to the UN, you've also been a national security advisor. Would you expect the, the, the American president and the British prime minister to call for a pause in in the, the bombing and the firing of missiles, if they thought Israel were not going to accede to that? Well, I don't think any Western powers have been urging Israel not to launch a ground invasion at all. Um, no, no, that's, I, no uh, I'm talking about the aerial. That's going to happen. Indeed, Mark, I'm um, talking about the aerial bombardment. And they won't call also for a ceasefire. No. For me, actually, one of the most controversial things that uh, Antonio Guterres, the UN Secretary General, said in his speech was calling for a ceasefire because a ceasefire is clearly of benefit to Hamas at the mm. moment and not of benefit to, to Israel. And, is, and the UK and American and various other Europeans would not support calls for a ceasefire. Yes. However, as you rightly say, they are calling for humanitarian pauses. Yes. So at least that there is some window, a few hours here, a few hours there, when there will it'll be completely safe from aerial bombardment. And so far, Israel has refused that, which I think is, is somewhat surprising. Mm. But they have taken this very tough line on a complete siege of Gaza, despite the fact that that is contrary to international humanitarian law. Um, and they aren't showing much sign of letting up on that at the moment. Yeah. So, I mean, you're being, 
you know, in, in temperate language, but you're being critical of Israel here in their approach to the UN, in the way uh, they are responding to these calls or not responding to calls for a humanitarian pause in the aerial attacks on Gaza targets. Do you, Mark, do you think Israel has thought through how to escalate this attack eventually into a ground invasion and save hostages and remove Hamas and then help Gaza or see tra- Gaza transition to a new form of government? Have they a plan that they've, that they've thought through, do you believe? Well, I think one of the reasons for the delay, I mean, it's true that the Americans more recently appear to be saying, please delay while we get our own air defense systems in the the region to protect our own troops. But undoubtedly, the hostages is a a complicating factor. Also, the the complexity of the military campaign is also delaying them um, whilst they prepare for that. But I think there is a third point, you hint at that, that, which is the day after, because even if Israel is successful in its stated objective of eliminating Hamas as a military threat full time and decapitates it as a political organization, yes. someone is going to have to administer Gaza and the 2.3 million inhabitants of Gaza uh, as soon as the Israelis leave. The Israelis do not want to occupy Gaza for all time. Um, the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank is neither capable nor have the credibility to do so. So at some point, there's going to have to be an arrangement. And I don't think the Israelis have really wanted to talk about the day after. They just want to get the job done. Whereas Western governments are saying, look, you have to think about the day after. And I wonder what that is. Does that involve, in a word, does that involve the UN? I think it almost certainly will. I mean, because the two alternatives that I mentioned, uh, the Israeli occupation and and the Palestinian Authority, are not credible, at least in the short term, then I think you're going to have to have some sort of international involvement. Now, that could be a combination of uh, local, um, regional countries like Saudi Arabia and Egypt, um, but it could also be a sort of trusteeship, more wider international trusteeship of the sort that we saw in the past in Cambodia, uh, in uh, Kosovo and East Timor, etc. Um, to sort of hold the territory, to administer the territory just from a governmental point of view, whilst a Palestinian leadership, can, a new Palestinian leadership can be built up to take over uh, the territory. 